On July 24, 2000, an unidentified male body was found approximately 27 miles off the coast of Maine, near the Grand Manan Banks. The discovery of this body left the detectives puzzled as there were no immediate leads. An autopsy was conducted on the remains, which included DNA and fingerprints. However, despite submitting the fingerprints to the FBI, no matches were found at the time. The case remained cold and unsolved for over two decades, until a miraculous breakthrough occurred in 2023. The human remains found off the coast of Maine were finally identified. The identification brought a sense of relief to the family, but it also raised more questions than answers. What crucial evidence surfaced in the identification of the unidentified male after more than two decades? Is there any surveillance footage linking the individual to the Atlantic Ocean off the coast of Maine? Maine is recognized for its majestic beauty and old world charm. It is known for its rocky coastline and is decorated with picturesque lighthouses. A few miles off the coast of Maine, close to the Canadian border, lies the Grand Manan Banks. The area also has been associated with maritime legends and tales, adding an aura of intrigue to its already enigmatic nature. Stories of ghost ships and strange happenings have long attracted the interest of sailors and residents of coastal areas. The Grand Manan Banks are a spectacular location, but they are also situated in an area with unstable weather and treacherous seas. Exploring this area should only be done cautiously and after careful planning. The whole region has the lowest crime rate among all other U.S. states. However, contrary to its safe backdrop, the place witnessed a horrific incident in the year 2000. On July 24, 2000, several human bones were found off the coast of Maine, close to Grand Manan Banks. The partially skeletonized remains were found by local boaters. As experts carefully retrieved the remains from the ocean, they noticed the person was wearing casual clothes, a digital watch on the wrist, a cozy pullover, and a blue knit shirt. Despite finding these personal items, the most crucial piece of information, the individual's identity, remained unknown. The harsh marine environment had taken its toll on the remains, making it difficult to determine the cause of death or the circumstances surrounding the person's passing. The main office of Chief Medical Examiner, OCME, conducted an autopsy and gathered DNA and fingerprint samples in an effort to identify the deceased. These initial efforts, meanwhile, were unsuccessful. The FBI received the fingerprints, but no matches were discovered. A DNA sample was also submitted to the FBI's Combined DNA Index, or CODIS, but that effort too failed to yield a match. During the initial examination, investigators were able to determine that the remains belonged to a male, likely discerning this detail from the clothing and belongings found nearby. It was also revealed from the autopsy that the person had been suffering from severe chronic conditions including emphysema, heart hypertrophy, and nephrosclerosis. However, an accurate cause of death could not be established, despite careful investigation. He was then officially given the John Doe name, an anonymous placeholder used by law enforcement agencies when a true name is unknown. The investigation pertaining to these human remains and its identification lingered for years, but unfortunately, no breakthroughs occurred. The case eventually went cold, despite the diligent efforts of police and law enforcement agencies. The case was reopened for further examination in 2019, 
about 20 years after the human remains were discovered off the coast of Maine. In an effort to identify the man, the chief medical examiner sought the assistance of a company named Parabon Nanolabs to undertake analysis and try forensic genealogy. The mystery lingered despite Parabon Nanolabs' efforts to examine the DNA and conduct forensic genealogy testing. The examination revealed that the male's remains belonged to an individual of Ashkenazi Jewish heritage, providing a new clue to the investigation. This lead, however, did not produce any valuable details or potential sources for learning the man's name or his family until three years later. New hope emerged when the OCME and the FBI's Criminal Justice Information Services, Deceased Persons Identification Services Division, DPI Services, met in March 2022. They explored the updated technologies available through the FBI to reevaluate the fingerprints found on the unidentified person. This re-examination led to a remarkable breakthrough. The unnamed person's fingerprints were sent to DPI services in May of 2022. And amazingly, they matched those of an 84-year-old Philip Kahn, an old retired cab driver from Las Vegas. The investigation had come full circle. Earlier in 2019, they made and released a composite sketch in an effort to gather further information, but no additional clues were found. Later, it was revealed that it bore an uncanny resemblance to the photo of Philip Kahn, which the medical examiner's office released at the time of the identification. The long-awaited truth finally surfaced. Philip's next of kin were notified, bringing a mix of relief and grief to the family after years of uncertainty. Philip Kahn was born in Manhattan in 1916. The early years of his life are not well known, although he had two brothers and a sister. It is said that initially he was born with the last name of Ehrlichman, a name he would later change to Kahn as it was tough to spell. He was born during the Great Depression and times of hardship, but he grew resilient riding the rails in search of work. He met his wife, Jean Oliver, in the early 1960s in Florida and eventually settled with her in Las Vegas in a mobile home park. Philip was known for his tall stature, infectious happiness, and love for warm weather. His friends in the Las Vegas taxi industry affectionately called him Stretch. Philip's spirit remained unfazed by the difficulties that life threw at him. He was a great swimmer, and he and Jean loved dancing and cruising. His fun-type nature was further highlighted by the fact that he once acted as an extra in the film Rain Man, along with his wife. Even at the age of 84 in the year 2000, he was still full of life. He always possessed a unique perspective on dealing with situations. He had an undisclosed disease, and his fantasies about receiving holistic care in Coral Gables, Florida, demonstrated his desire to look into non-traditional treatment choices rather than deciding to undergo surgery. It was the 9th of July, 2000. Philip had just got out of bed in the morning and made a surprising announcement to his family. Philip decided to board a plane bound for Florida all by himself. His reason was to seek holistic treatment for a health condition troubling him. Days went by, and anxiety and worry filled the hearts of his family members, especially Jean and her daughter Judy Drago. No one had seen or heard from Philip since that fateful day. The family combed through their home and neighborhood, desperately seeking clues about his whereabouts. The family reported Philip missing to the Metropolitan Police Department on July 21st, 2000, after exploring all other potential possibilities for 12 days. An original missing person report was filed, 
documenting the last known details of Philip's activities, including his departure from home on July 9, 2000, and the journey to the airport. As soon as the missing report was filed, the police began the investigation. Philip had apparently left his home around 7 o'clock in the evening of July 9, 2000, with a neighbor who transported him to McCarran International Airport. He informed his family that he was traveling to Coral Gables, Florida to receive holistic treatment for what might have been an aortic embolism. It was determined that Philip had not only just vanished, but had also engaged in a number of puzzling behaviors before his disappearance. It was found that Philip liquidated all of his assets, wrote a letter, and sent money to his sister and gave his wife Jean power of attorney. What puzzled everyone further was the revelation of a new Visa credit card that Jean was unaware of and didn't know the number for. These actions left the family with a trail of questions, seeking to understand the motives behind such decisions. As the family grappled with uncertainty and the absence of any leads, they received a surprising revelation from the Metropolitan Police Department. Airline records indicated that Philip had flown to New York, contradicting the destination he had initially mentioned to his family. The family later discovered that Khan's airline ticket cost $162 as it was checked by detectives. This revelation confused them even more, wondering why he diverted from his intended path. The family was also asked if he had intentions of taking his own life. However, there were no indications that he had had any intention of ending his life. Drago's stepdaughter stated that Philip did not have such tendencies in him. He was just determined to resolve and confront his issue via alternative means. She quoted, Not me, not mom, or anybody felt like he had such desires. Fortunately, the discovery of Philip's remains was made possible via forensic genealogy. It is an emerging and rapidly advancing practice that has gained popularity in criminal investigations and cases involving unidentified individuals from the past. Genetic genealogists use DNA samples to generate genetic profiles that are then uploaded to databases that are open to the public. Numerous instances have been connected or solved as a result of this method, putting an end to old mysteries. Assistance in the investigation also came from the Jane Doe Project, a nonprofit organization based in California dedicated to identifying unidentified individuals from various historical periods. As the OCME worked diligently to unlock the mystery of the man found off the coast of Maine, the Jane Doe Project continued its efforts to identify a Victorian era child whose remains were discovered in Samford in 2017. The medical examiner's office has also utilized forensic genealogy to solve another long-standing cold case, that of baby Jane Doe in Frenchville, whose death in 1985 had remained unsolved for more than 36 years. The office is dedicated to prioritizing cases involving unidentified remains and is actively exploring various records to find usable DNA samples. In some older cases, exhuming remains may be necessary to extract DNA for analysis. The pursuit of new identification techniques is ongoing, with a collaborative effort alongside the Jane Doe Project to identify Jane Doe Portland, whose body was found in the ocean near Portland in 2015. Early indications from forensic genealogy suggest she may have been of Korean descent. Although the journey to identifying these individuals can be arduous and lengthy, it is a truly exhilarating moment for the medical examiner's office when they can give a name back to a person 
who has remained nameless for so long. Providing closure to families and solving these cold cases underscores the importance of never giving up hope in seeking justice for the unidentified and missing. It serves as a reminder of the unwavering commitment of investigators to bring answers and closure to these cases, no matter how challenging the road may be. In this case, the successful application of forensic genetic genealogy also serves as a testament to the progress made in forensic sciences. Through advancements in DNA technology and the collaboration of dedicated organizations, mysteries that once seemed insurmountable can now be unraveled. Closure finally came after more than two decades for the family of Philip Kahn. When the body was identified as Philip's, it brought back memories and a sense of relief to his loved ones. Judy Drago, Khan's stepdaughter, expressed gratitude and bewilderment at finally knowing what happened to him. We have more questions than answers, Drago said, reflecting on the uncertainty that still lingered. The revelation of Khan's fate brought back memories of the life he shared with her mother, Jean Oliver, which had abruptly stopped when he vanished. The family was filled with sadness, but there was also a sense of closure, finally laying to rest the years of wondering and searching. Jean Kahn, who had been a beloved preschool teacher, lived for several years after her husband's disappearance, but passed away in December 2007 at the age of 89. She endured the emotional turmoil expected of someone whose spouse had vanished without a trace. Yet she carried on with grace and resilience. Despite the roller coaster of emotions, Jean did not let the disappearance define her life. She continued to live fully, cherishing the memories of the life she and Philip had built together. Judy Drago expressed surprise at her mother's resolve during those challenging times. Drago remarked, amazingly well remembering her mother's response to the disappearance. Despite the never-ending questions and heartbreak, she regained a sense of normalcy and continued living her life. The medical examiner's office administrator, Lindsay Chasteen, also shared her opinion on the significance of this identification. We're overjoyed to be able to identify him and inform the family of what happened to their loved one. The family had endured the burden of ignorance for so long, but they were now at last in possession of some answers. Still, there are many remaining mysteries related to the case. Lindsay mentions the fact that it will never be known how Philip ended up there. This unanswered question still adds to the mystery. However, in the end, the family has somewhat found a sense of peace in knowing that the body found was of Philip Kahn. This brings closure and a sense of finality to a chapter that has remained open for far too long. 40-year-old Marlene Warren was killed by a killer clown at her doorstep in the late morning of May 26, 1990. The inexplicable clown hysteria had intrigued nations for decades captivating collective fear and curiosity. Childhood fears, social media, and psychology have all combined to fuel the global expansion of such clown sightings. The frightening story of Marlene Warren serves as an example of such crazed fascination. This incident, which took place in Wellington, West Palm Beach, Florida, captivated investigators, Florida residents, and true crime enthusiasts for more than three decades. The investigation was like an unsolvable puzzle that ultimately experienced a major breakthrough in 2017 and reached its conclusion in 2023. Why did it take more than three decades for the murder mystery to be solved? Who was the killer clown responsible for the death of Marlene Warren? 
It is a general consensus that overall violent crimes like murder, assault, or sexual exploitation happen less often in Palm Beach County than in most of America. The lovely village of Wellington lies in the center of this county. It combines the best aspects of natural beauty and modern commodities. The total crime index of Wellington is also 54% lower than other U.S. neighborhoods. This is why, on the dreadful day of May 26, 1990, the murder of Marlene Warren left a permanent mark on this peaceful community. Marlene Warren was born on April 15, 1950, in a relatively middle-class family in Mount Clemens, Michigan, USA. Her mother, Shirley Twing, and stepfather Bill Twing raised her. When Marlene was young, in her teens, she married her first husband, John Ahrens, in the early 1960s. Soon after, the couple welcomed two children, John Ahrens Jr. and Joseph Ahrens. By the time she was 20, the couple had parted ways. In the early 1980s, she then met Michael Warren. Michael and Marlene Ahrens fell in love soon after they first met. Marlene was a newly divorced single mother of two. They got hitched right away and started a family in Wellington, Florida, where they prospered as a couple. Marlene oversaw their rental properties in West Palm Beach, while Michael ran a used vehicle dealership rental car company by the name of Bargain Motors. After the terrible loss of Marlene's son, John Aarons Jr., in a vehicle accident in 1988, their happiness was shattered. Their relationship became further strained when rumors of an affair between Michael and an employee named Sheila Keen surfaced. Marlene's family revealed that she used to question whether she could leave her husband and keep a fair portion of their assets because she had grown increasingly doubtful of his loyalty. Financially, the 40-year-old was living an entirely different life in Florida by 1990, thanks to her determination. She was successfully handling the family's rental properties business, residing in a luxurious private community. However, what mattered to those closest to her was not her wealth or success, but how she'd always been a kind, cheerful, and adoring lady. Unfortunately, her life was mercilessly cut short by a senseless act of violence. This inhumane incident left a void in the hearts of her loved ones, especially her son, Joseph Ahrens. The time was 11 a.m. on May 26, 1990. Marlene followed her routine that morning just like any other day. She was having breakfast with her son, Joe Ahrens, and some friends he had invited over. Everyone had gathered in the family room when they heard a knock on the door. They were unaware this knock would be the precursor to a tragic event. Marlene answered it, possibly anticipating a delivery or a visitor. What she saw was a clown carrying balloons and flowers. The clown handed over both flowers and the balloon to her. Then, without warning, Marlene was shot in the face by the clown, and she fell to the ground while her son and friends were having breakfast. This left a scene of mayhem and bewilderment behind as the clown casually returned to their white Chrysler convertible without remorse. Witnesses said the clown soon fled in the automobile, while Marlene fell down barely breathing. Joe was shocked as Marlene collapsed to the ground, unable to fathom the abrupt incident that had occurred before his eyes. Joe and his friends sprinted to Marlene's side, trying their best to help, while also dealing with the shock of the circumstance. A worried neighbor called 911 admits the chaos to let the authorities know about the terrible crime that had just happened. The news of the shooting spread throughout the neighborhood leaving residents stunned and frightened. The police were now tasked with unraveling the mystery surrounding Marlene Warren's murder 
and bringing the perpetrator to justice. The police initially interviewed her son, Joseph Ahrens, who was present at the scene. While explaining the crime, Joseph said that the last words he heard his mother say were, Oh, how pretty! Some neighbors also described the clown's appearance to be that of a male. They stated the clown had a painted smile, a red bulb nose, and an orange wig carrying some balloons and flowers. The police began searching for where the costume could have come from. The balloons, flowers, and distinct clown costume led the police to the exact store from where they were bought. Deborah Offerman, a worker at the shop where the clown accessories were bought, provided them with a lead. She told the detectives that a woman had entered the shop just before she was closing and insisted on purchasing a costume for that particular evening. The woman the shopkeeper was referring to resembled Sheila Keen, a member of Michael Warren's staff. This was the same woman that had been rumored to be having an affair with Michael. However, both Michael Warren and Keen denied any involvement in the murder or the alleged affair when questioned by the police. Nonetheless, Sheila Keen was now a leading suspect in the investigation. She was positively identified as the customer who bought the clown suit by other costume shop employees. The silver balloon discovered at the crime site was also purchased by a lady who resembled Keen, according to eyewitnesses, from a public's grocery store close to Keen's residence. In addition, the police also found an abandoned Chrysler LeBaron, thought to be the getaway vehicle in a Winn-Dixie parking lot four days later. Investigators discovered traces of evidence inside the car, including synthetic orange-like threads that could have originated from a clown wig. Long brown human hair strands were also found, which would eventually become vital to the case. Unfortunately, there were still many obstacles to overcome. The DNA analysis at the time was not advanced enough to obtain relevant DNA information from the hair samples found in the car. Despite this, the police continued to gather additional information. It was also discovered that Michael Warren had previously questioned his lawyer about the repercussions of a husband killing his wife. Christopher DeSantis, Michael's attorney, stated that Michael asked him, if a husband were to kill his wife, what would happen to her estate? He added that, my first impression was, is this guy nuts? Because why would you ask that question with your wife there? DeSantis told police in 1991, Then I took a look around and his wife wasn't there. The investigators were unsure whether this was only a coincidence or a major hint. During that same year, an investigator from the Palm Beach County Sheriff's Office received a call from Maine officials informing them that a prisoner named Barr had confessed to the killing. Barr shared accurate information about the killings with a fellow prisoner at Maine State Prison while confined in solitary confinement. He asserted that he had shot the woman while dressed as a clown, that her husband ran a used car business named Bargain Motors, and that a young man had come out of one of the rooms just after the killing. Barr also allegedly mentioned that a female biker type had obtained the clown costume from the costume shop and that the victim's husband hired him during a meeting at the Mermaid Bar. Later, a taped interview was made available with the prisoner who had received Barr's confession. Barr detailed how he approached the victim's home in broad daylight while dressed as a clown. When the woman opened the door after he knocked and pretended to have a delivery, he smiled and pointed a revolver at her face before shooting her. According to reports, Barr claimed that the victim's spouse gave him a large sum to murder because she was divorcing him and would inherit the auto dealership. But still, there were a lot of loopholes. The authenticity and validity of Barr's confession were questioned. Michael Warren was found guilty of other offenses like felony racketeering in 1994 for which he also served three years. 
The home of Sheila Keene was also searched, but nothing suspicious was discovered. Marlene's family members also reportedly informed the police in the year 2000 about Marlene wanting to leave her husband because she thought he was having an affair. However, she feared what might happen if she did because the car lot and other properties were in her name. According to reports, she said to her mother, if anything happens to me, Mike did it. But this wasn't enough for the police to make an arrest and soon the leads had almost completely evaporated, leaving the detectives frustrated. The case slowly started to approach a dead end, despite the growing amount of suspicions. Unfortunately, the inquiry into Marlene Warren's murder ultimately turned cold. The investigation was revived, and the truth started to unfold in 2013. Reed Scott, a newly hired investigator, became interested in the protracted case. He revisited the forensic evidence found during the initial investigation. The reinvestigation led to one significant discovery when Scott directed that mitochondrial DNA analysis be used to examine the hairs found in the vehicle. Mitochondrial DNA analysis is a specialist method that is great for analyzing older materials, and Scott saw its promise. By 2017, the DNA analysis findings were revealed. According to the investigators, the hairs discovered at the crime scene were identified as belonging to Sheila Keen Warren. The lead suspect during the initial investigation was now back in the spotlight. Sheila Keen Warren was born on the 8th of June, 1963. She mostly spent her childhood on farms in central Florida. From a young age, she was fearless and even carried a gun, an A-38. She had a few minor run-ins and shoplifting cases at a young age, but all had negligible consequences. Interestingly, she also had a habit of dressing up like a clown when she was young. She initially encountered Marlene and Michael Warren back in the 1980s. Sheila began working for Michael's used rental automobile business as a repossession agent, which allowed her to interact closely with him. Their working relationship grew increasingly personal over time, giving rise to rumors of an affair. They continuously denied such rumors during the investigation. However, once it went cold, they got married in 2002, after which they moved to Abingdon, Virginia. During the initial weeks post-murder, authorities interrogated Sheila and Michael in depth to find any links to the murder. Sheila vehemently denied any wrongdoing, despite accumulating evidence that pointed to her involvement. It included the testimony of costume shop employees, who attested to Sheila's purchase of a clown suit, and the precise balloons discovered at the crime site. Meanwhile, no real evidence was found against Michael. Evidence that Sheila was guilty kept mounting as the investigation went on. Long brown hairs and orange-colored fibers were discovered in the putative getaway automobile, found only four days after the murder. These discoveries give her even more cause for suspicion. As discussed earlier, Sheila was connected to the murder through the DNA examination of hairs collected at the site. This marked a significant development in the case, reigniting hopes that Marlene Warren would finally receive justice. On September 26, 2017, the arrest warrant was issued, and she was apprehended at her home in the Appalachian Mountains awaiting extradition to Florida to face a first-degree murder charge. With Sheila Keen Warren's arrest, the case that had lain dormant for nearly 30 years was solved, reminding everyone of the horrifying crime that had plagued the neighborhood. The relentless work of the detectives and advances in DNA technology had captured the alleged killer at the heart of this strange and puzzling cold case. A television reporter, Von Sant, approached Sheila's husband, Michael, two years after her detention. 
he requested an interview at his home. Warren hesitated to open his front door but spoke with Van San through the glass panel for more than seven minutes. During their conversation, Van San asked Warren if he knew of the plot to kill his wife Marlene. Warren immediately and categorically denied having any involvement in such matters, saying, I did not. He reaffirmed his innocence when Van Sant pressed him more, saying, Definitely not. Van Sant continued the interview by questioning Warren about his purported advice that Sheila dress up as a clown. In response to this query, Warren questioned the claim's veracity, stating, Who says she even did that? He affirmed his confidence in Sheila's innocence by saying, I don't think that she had anything to do with this. Warren highlighted that he would not have kept a connection with her if he had any reservations about her complicity. Warren did not answer when the Associated Press called him later to ask him for comment on his remarks. Since 2017, Sheila Keen Warren had been detained while she awaited her trial for first-degree murder. However, the COVID-19 outbreak and legal disputes over the evidence caused multiple delays in the trial. She was finally granted a start date in May of 2023 for the trial. Greg Rosenfeld was Sheila's defense lawyer, and he vigorously fought for his client throughout the court case. To everyone's surprise, after spending approximately six years behind bars, Sheila accepted a plea deal from prosecutors, pleading guilty to second-degree murder. According to NBC, if Sheila was found guilty during the trial, she might have been sentenced to life in prison. In a statement, Dave Ehrenberg, the state attorney for Palm Beach County, said that Sheila had finally acknowledged her involvement in the murder. He mentioned she would spend the rest of her life as a murderer. Sheila was given a 12-year prison sentence as a result of the verdict, which the judge announced. However, she was scheduled to be freed from prison the following year after receiving credit for the time she had already served behind bars and based on good behavior. The plea deal even shook Sheila's attorney. However, he still argued that his client was innocent and that she merely agreed to the plea agreement to avoid serving a longer prison term. He questioned the prosecution's DNA evidence calling it the weakest he had seen throughout his professional career. Rosenfeld stated, According to the lab reports, DNA on two hairs found in the clown's getaway car didn't conclusively match Keen Warren. Rosenfeld further added that, One DNA sample somehow showed both male and female genes. The other sample could have come from one out of every 20 women, even Marlene Warren's. And even if that hair did come from Keen Warren, it could have been deposited before the car was reported stolen. He also acknowledged that there were some gaps in the evidence, but claimed that was because the crime had occurred so long ago. And despite Keen Warren's claims to the contrary, she had been found guilty of murder in a strange case that had captured the country's attention for decades, he said. While Rosenfeld maintained that the case had serious flaws and that his client had agreed to the arrangement to win her release and be reunited with her family, State Attorney Ehrenberg felt that justice had been done. Despite the long wait for justice, Marlene's family remained focused on finding peace and moving forward from the painful past. The family had undergone years of uncertainty and loss and was now relieved after Sheila's arrest and subsequent conviction. All of them expressed a range of emotions in response to these developments. Everybody suspected there was something going on between the two of them, said Bill Twing, Marlene's stepfather. Twing also expressed his relief at Sheila's verdict, stating, I feel good. I can't truthfully say I've ever seen her. I'm not angry that it took so long because I understand why. He expressed that he found peace once Sheila was found guilty. Marlene's son Joseph expressed his happiness at Sheila Keen Warren's arrest and conviction. 
He expressed his hope that she could make peace with God and that justice had been done. Joseph has now decided to move on with his life, underlining the importance of keeping his mother's legacy and memories close to his heart. The detectives and law enforcement officials involved in the case also felt satisfied with the arrest and conviction. During one such press conference, Palm Beach County State Attorney Dave Ehrenberg stated, Sheila Keen Warren has finally been forced to admit that she was the one who dressed as a clown and took the life of an innocent victim. She will be a convicted murderer for the rest of her days. The remarks conveyed a sense of justice served and a belief that closure had been achieved. Although the family can never regain their beloved Marlene, they find peace in Sheila Keen Warren's capture and conviction. They can find comfort and continue with their lives because it gives them a feeling of justice. Although wounds still linger, the case's conclusion provides solace and the chance to honor Marlene's legacy while seeking healing. Do you think the arrest and conviction of Sheila Keen Warren truly brought a sense of closure to the case? What do you think the impact of this case will be on future investigations? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. We'd love to hear from you. If there's a case you'd like us to cover, don't hesitate to share your suggestions in the comment section below. Like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more captivating true crime stories. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the complex and intriguing case of Marlene Warren. On the bright and sunny day of February 12, 1994, Placentia resident Mary Torres was patiently waiting for her 20-year-old daughter, Kathy Torres, to return home from work. As the hours passed and Kathy failed to appear, anxiety began to set in. Such a delay had never happened before. Deeply troubled by the absence of any sight of her daughter, Mary quickly contacted the police, and a thorough search began. Days later, the most dreaded circumstance every mother fears happened. The lifeless body of her daughter was found in the trunk of her car. What exactly could have led to the death of this young lady? Who could have committed this inhuman act of homicide? Placentia, California is part of Southern California, known more for its peaceful parks and quiet suburbs than any flashy Hollywood glamour. Largely residential, Placentia's charm lay in its amiable inhabitants, who took pride in their friendly, sun-kissed neighborhoods. In this friendly, sports-loving town, secrets were rare and everyone knew each other's dogs. Placentia's unlocked doors and low crime rate defied harsh realities. Yet, back in 1994, the peaceful community was shattered by a crime that would remain unsolved for nearly three decades. Kathy Torres, born on June 4, 1973, to Mary Torres and Martin Torres in the sun-drenched expanses of Orange County, California, was an exceptional woman in an everyday setting. Following her parents' separation, she found strength in the unyielding love of her tight-knit Hispanic community and her siblings, Tina, Marty, and Debbie. Their laughter and camaraderie filled the halls of their Walnut Avenue home in Placentia, a beacon of joy in an increasingly complex world. A neighborhood cherub turned straight-A scholar Kathy's childhood was steeped in roller skating escapades and bike rides. Her days colored by the innocent bond she shared with her neighbors, including the Lopez brothers, a family of boys who lived across the street. Post high school, she took her vibrant spirit and academic prowess to Cal State Fullerton, majoring in sociology, with the unwavering aspiration of becoming a social worker. With her name adorning the university's honor roll, Kathy balanced two part-time jobs while saving up for a symbol of her hard-earned independence, a second-hand burgundy 1990 Toyota Corolla. 
Her family were all proud of her achievements. Little did they know that her world, so full of promise, was teetering on the edge of a chilling abyss. The year was 1993, and Kathy Torres had reunited with her high school flame, Samuel Sam Augustin Lopez, at her sister's wedding. Little did Kathy know this rekindled romance was about to lead her into a whirlwind of tumultuous events. Both the Torres and Lopez families shared the same neighborhood, the same air, and the same community spirit. Kathy and Sam found themselves intertwined again, stealing moments together after her work shifts. Yet their relationship was no fairy tale. It was as stormy as a tempest at sea. In 1994, they each sought solace in the arms of other people. Kathy even found herself ensnared in the throes of a serious relationship with another boy named Albert Rangel at the time. On a fateful day, Kathy arrived home late. She appeared to be under the influence of something, her undergarments missing, and with no recollection of the evening. Her mother was understandably worried, but like many mothers, she hoped for the best and did not go to the authorities. A couple of days later, Kathy's boyfriend Albert, who had always wanted to get married to her, attempted to take his own life after she rejected his proposal, leaving a letter behind. While he survived, he fell into a coma. Kathy was in a tight spot, juggling emotions that one can only imagine. That brings us to February 12th, 1994, a day that was as normal as any other Saturday in Placentia, California. Kathy worked her evening shift at the local Savon handling reels and canisters in the photo department. At the end of her shift, she called her mother to check if she needed anything. After the call, her mother lost herself in the world of television, blissfully unaware of the tragic turn their lives were about to take. The morning after was the definition of every parent's worst nightmare. Kathy's bed, untouched, held no traces of her return. Her mother, Mary, knew something was awry. As reliable as Kathy was, she always informed her of her plans. Mary rang Kathy's friends, but to no avail. Kathy was missing. Frustration seared through Mary like wildfire as the police informed her they could only file a missing persons report after 24 hours. Determined and terrified, Mary rallied her troops the family and friends launched their own search operation, plastering the town with missing person flyers. After 24 hours when Kathy still hadn't returned, the police finally launched an official missing persons investigation. For a week, authorities and volunteers ransacked Placentia searching for any sign of Kathy or her car. The torment of not knowing gnawed at her family's hearts until they found her burgundy Toyota Corolla on February 19, 1994, in a hospital parking lot just a few miles away from their house. A patrol officer had spotted it, and soon the nightmare unfolded. The sight inside the car was horrific. The front seat was awash with blood, and crammed inside the trunk, was Kathy's lifeless body. She had been stabbed over 70 times. She had defensive wounds on her hands, indicating a fierce struggle. The driver's seat of the car was fully reclined, suggesting someone taller had driven her car that night. The purse was missing, leading police to consider a possible robbery. But the ferocity of the attack hinted at something personal. As the dust settled on this gruesome discovery, one thing became clear. The attack on Kathy was not just violent, it was viciously personal. The investigators had their work cut out for them. This case was about to lead them down a winding path as they began to look for someone who was likely close to Kathy, someone she knew. 
As the proverbial gears of justice began to turn, the detectives plunged headlong into the case of the unfortunate Kathy Torres. Now the crime scene had quite a few jarring elements. There was the poor girl's body, tragically discarded in her car trunk, a grim image that would make even the sternest of faces blanch. The cause of death, however, was shrouded in mystery. The autopsy report revealed a picture so grotesque she had slashes on her wrists, neck, and a visible handprint of hers was found inside the trunk, proof that she was alive when crammed into it. It wasn't for the faint-hearted. This was not the work of a thief surprised during a burglary, or some random act of violence. It had the signature of a vengeful act. The community, heartbroken and horrified, rallied together, transforming the sorrow into a manic manhunt. The path to justice was extremely challenging, almost like trying to climb a mountain without the right equipment. Every lead and clue seemed to hit a dead end. The autopsy sparked additional theories, and the detectives set up a hotline, offering a cash reward to encourage tips that could lead them to the perpetrator. The investigation was intense and diligently pursued. Witnesses were interviewed, alibis were checked and rechecked. The usual suspects were rounded up, including Sam Lopez, Kathy's high school sweetheart, and a certain Xavier, who as it turned out, was Sam's older cousin. The spotlight turned on to them when the cops dug up the dirt that the duo frequented the store where Kathy worked. On the fateful night, Kathy had plans to meet Sam, placing him squarely on the suspect list. Here's where the plot thickens. Both Sam and Xavier claimed they were innocent, insisting they had been helping a friend move to Corona. Their alibis checked out, and the two were released, but not before leaving behind samples of their DNA and fingerprints. In a twist straight out of a thriller novel, Sam dropped a bombshell. He pointed the finger at Albert, the chap who had tried to off himself just days before Kathy's demise. The detectives were all over this new lead. However, it soon turned out that the ex-Albert Rangel was comatose when Kathy was killed, ruling him out as the possible perpetrator. But he did introduce an intriguing subplot to the narrative. Albert had been after a more serious relationship with Kathy, who had gently rebuffed him. As the investigation crawled along, its impact was felt far and wide. The victim's family, aching with the loss and pining for closure, watched the developments with bated breath. The community, too, was on edge, their daily lives overshadowed by the gruesome crime that had shaken their peaceful existence. Alas, despite the tireless effort, the leads grew cold. Fingerprints found on Kathy's car, initially a hopeful glimmer, proved to be of no use as there was no match in the database. Even the samples from Sam and Xavier hit a dead end. With that, the once hot case cooled down, leaving the detectives trapped in a chilling suspense. In the spring of 1997, the breeze of hope fluttered again. The now frostbitten case of Kathy Torres was given a chance as the Placentia Police Department found itself with a grant that might just breathe new life into cold cases. Mary Torres seized this opportunity and urged Detective Darren Wyatt to re-examine her daughter's case. Detective Wyatt then agreed to take a fresh look at the case. As Detective Wyatt sifted through the initial investigation, he stumbled upon a blunder. The police, in their initial investigation, had been as focused on Sam Lopez like a moth to a flame, never pausing to test Xavier's fingerprints against the ones found in Kathy's car. With great speed, the investigators sent Xavier's fingerprints for a comparison 
with the ones found in the car. By June 1997, the police received the revelation they'd been yearning for. Xavier Lopez's DNA was discovered on the car's back panel, and his fingerprints were found on the trunk. In the ensuing interrogation that same month of June, the police grilled Xavier with a series of questions. Had he ever been in Kathy's car? Had he ever helped her carry groceries or tinkered with her car like a backyard mechanic? He denied all of these scenarios, and the police felt they'd caught him red-handed. After all, he'd essentially admitted that his fingerprints could only have landed on that car if he was embroiled in the crime. By October 1997, Xavier Lopez found himself facing the grim face of a murder charge. But in a huge twist, all charges were dropped within days of his arrest. The district attorney sternly informed the detectives that their evidence was as thin as a sheet of paper. They needed to produce the murder weapon, find Xavier's DNA or fingerprints on Kathy's body, not just the car or wrangle a confession out of him, or else he was going to walk free. And walk free he did, as the detectives, try as they might, were unable to conjure up the necessary evidence. Once again, the investigators found themselves staring at a blank wall, the case slipping back into the frosty grasp of unsolved mysteries. When the Torres family uncovered the police findings, their conviction that the Lopez boys had a hand in Kathy's demise was hardened. In a scenario straight out of a suspense thriller, the Torres and Lopez families continued their lives just a stone's throw away from each other. Mary, Kathy's mother, became a living embodiment of the phrase, if looks could kill, as she would look across the street at Sam. Meanwhile, Tina, Kathy's sister, decided to play the detective herself. She grilled her husband, Armando, who was Sam's older brother, about Xavier's fingerprints being found. Armando brushed it off, suggesting the prints must have been a mistake, or perhaps from before the murder, insisting that his brothers were as innocent as lambs. Despite the incessant pleas of Mary, Tina, and the rest of Kathy's family to dig deeper into the Lopez family, the police seemed to have hit a brick wall and could not proceed without new evidence. But, as the saying goes, patience is bitter, but its fruit is sweet. By 2006, Mary and Tina unearthed some letters Sam had penned to Kathy before her tragic death. The correspondence revealed their relationship had turned sour, and it strongly indicated that Sam was verbally and possibly physically abusive. This was the catalyst that propelled the police to restart their investigation. As the investigation picked up pace, the police set up 24-hour surveillance on Xavier and Sam's residences. Xavier's frequent sleepovers at Sam's house raised a few eyebrows, given that Sam was now a family man. In 2007, the police decided to give technology another chance to play the hero. They retested all of Kathy's clothes for DNA, keeping their fingers crossed that advancements in technology might unearth something they'd missed in the initial investigation. The results came back with a breakthrough worthy of a drum roll. Xavier's DNA was found on Kathy's sock and her shirt around the armpit area but Sam's DNA was once again absent from the findings. However, with this evidence, they had just enough evidence to charge Xavier with murder. During the subsequent interrogation, Xavier, perhaps feeling the walls closing in on him, decided to sing like a canary. He claimed that he'd been in his truck when Sam attacked Kathy after a heated argument and that he'd only aided in disposing of the body. This twist in the tale was the cherry on the police's investigative cake. Xavier's confession led them to bring in Sam. 
This led to the arrest of Sam, and this time, he was also drilled with questions on his part in the murder case. And within a short period of time, he was also charged to court for the murder of Kathy. Fast forward to Sam's trial in 2015. The prosecution painted a picture of Sam as a scorned lover, enraged that Kathy had declined his marriage proposal. Sam cornered like a rat, finally confessed to the murder, and apologized to the Torres family. As the trial drew to a close, the curtain fell on another shocking revelation. The police had long wondered how these two cousins managed to elude justice for so long. They discovered that Armando Lopez, Sam's elder brother and Tina's husband, was also privy to the murder and had aided in committing the crime. Armando pleaded guilty to obstructing justice and got a light tap on the wrist with a one-year probation sentence. In the end, the police's tireless efforts and a few letters eventually exposed the nefarious brotherhood that had managed to dodge the law for over two decades. Despite the families coming together for all the wrong reasons, justice finally got the upper hand, demonstrating that truth may take time, but it always wins. The Torres family's response to the arrest and sentencing of all the culprits involved in Kathy's death was bittersweet. On one hand, their fury at the Lopez clan for stealing their precious Kathy away, but it was tempered by a wave of gratitude towards the tireless detectives. Their loss was palpable, a constant reminder of the future that had been snuffed out far too early. However, amid their grief, there was also a spark of relief, a solace that justice, though it took its sweet time, finally crossed the finish line. The detectives were satisfied and relieved about the closure of the case, but they also felt a bit exhausted from it all. For nearly four decades, a chilling shadow hung over the picturesque city of Green Bay a haunting tale of a murder that defied resolution. The heart-wrenching narrative began with the tragic end of a promising life. The life of 22-year-old Lisa Holstead, a young girl who was murdered on August 12, 1986. For years, the people of Green Bay yearned for justice, haunted by the memory of Lisa's life cut tragically short. The case gradually slipped into the realm of cold and forgotten mysteries and remained there for years until it finally reached its resolution in 2023. How did investigators catch the murderer after all these years? Why did this case take so long to get resolved? Green Bay, Wisconsin is a city located on the shores of Lake Michigan and is known for its rich football heritage and the strong devotion of its residents to the Green Bay Packers. The city is known for its football fever. Besides it, the city boasts beautiful scenery and landscapes and offers nature lovers a peaceful getaway to stay in Green Bay. Green Bay accompanied a community-centered lifestyle where neighbors share family-like bonds, making it a place where everyone knows each other's names. But even in the warmth of the neighborhood, a heinous murder took place that shattered the whole community in 1986. In the heart of Green Bay, Wisconsin, there lived a young woman, Lisa Holstead. She was born on May 12, 1964, the daughter of Mary and Robert Holstead. Her adolescence turned into a tapestry of love and laughter and she grew up in a tight-knit community which felt like an extended family. One of Lisa's favorite hobbies was traveling. She spent hours capturing the beauty she encountered through her camera's lens. Her aspirations were not confined to exploration alone. She envisioned opening a cozy bookstore, filled with antique books and sharing her love for literature with fellow bibliophiles. 
From an early age, Lisa stood out for her keen mind and kind heart. She had an insatiable interest in the area around her. She was always keen to learn and discover. Even as a baby, she was drawn to the natural beauty of her surroundings. The lush Kenyors nature area with its winding trails and abundant wildlife became a place of solace for her. She often spent her time in local shelters, offering comfort to the unlucky. Animals, too, were dear to her, and she often rescued strays, showering them with love. Her relationship with Kenyors nature area became more strong. She spent the majority of her time helping people. No one had anticipated the cruel fate that awaited her, shattering the peace of her beloved safe haven. On an unfortunate day, the 12th of August, 1986, Lisa Holstead disappeared in the Kenyors nature area. When she didn't return for a long time, her parents started to get worried. Fear gripped their hearts as they searched for her everywhere, hoping to find something about her. As the sun began to set, the once vibrant community felt the weight of uncertainty that overwhelmed it. The Holsteads, neighbors, and friends were all shocked by the disappearance of their beloved Lisa. As they searched for her with no success, the fear gripped everyone, and they started to anticipate what could have happened to Lisa. There was panic in the air of Green Bay as nobody was getting answers to their questions. They called the Green Bay Police Department with their shaky voices conveying the urgency of the situation. They didn't know that the tragedy of their beloved Lisa Holstead would set off an intense, decades-long search for answers. On the very same day of August 12th, she was found dead in a marshy area of Kenyors by a passerby. The police were quickly informed and officers from Green Bay Police reached there instantly. A piece of clothing that apparently belonged to Lisa herself could be seen around her neck, proving that she was strangled. It was found out that she was indeed assaulted and killed. Beyond the crime, the heartache of the community was unimaginable. The once inviting Kenyors nature area became a haunting reminder of loss and the terrible truth buried in its foliage. Their shared grief was a testament to Lisa's profound impact on their lives. Detectives from the Green Bay Police Department searched the crime scene. Many questions were already dotting their minds. Who did this? What did they do? And most importantly, why? Detectives investigating the crime scene found Lisa's lifeless body in a muddy area. Early investigations suggested violence and terrible torture. The results of the autopsy revealed the terrible truth. Lisa had been assaulted and strangled. The police department of Green Bay was unable to find the murderer. They collected many items as evidence from the crime site, including DNA, that they hoped would one day help solve the case. The whole community of Green Bay was in a state of anxiety and unease. Roadblocks continued to surface as the investigation intensified. Witness testimonies led to possible suspects, but no one could find out who killed Lisa. They searched for her in every possible way, but the solid alibis thwarted their progress at every turn. Detectives were determined to find the truth behind Lisa's murder. They were searching in every way possible, but couldn't find the right evidence to reach the depths of the case. They stated that, It doesn't matter. It looks like the killer was trying to throw us off their trail. Detectives never stopped searching for the truth, but despite their relentless efforts, the case eventually went cold. The once hot pursuit became a mysterious puzzle, and the answers shrouded in darkness. Lisa's memory lingered, a terrifying reminder of a terrible murder and 
and unsolved crime. For decades, the tragic murder of Lisa Holstead remained unsolved, baffling investigators and the victim's family seeking closure. New hope emerged in 2020, when the search was revived. Detective Rachel Turner, a steady and determined investigator, took a keen interest in the cold case. Her dedication and passion for justice inspired the decision to reopen the case, and it brought a ray of hope to Lisa's loved ones. The team under Detective Turner put much effort into reinvestigating the whole case. They were hopeful of getting a clue which would resolve the case. They thoroughly investigated everything and interviewed the witnesses. All the old evidence was once again opened and investigated. The turning moment emerged when the DNA found at the crime scene was re-examined. But this time, it was done through genetic engineering's latest technology. In April 2022, the DNA sample was sent to Othram Inc., a renowned genetic engineering lab in Texas. The experts in the field started to look into this matter. The DNA was extracted and uploaded to the national database to catch the criminal. Everyone was anxiously waiting to get some good news about the case. A fateful day arrived and finally a suspect's name appeared on the database. But there was a problem. That it was not a direct match. Experts at Othram worked hard to trace the whole family tree to find the exact match. Detective Turner expanded her investigation and surprisingly, she found out that the suspect whose DNA was found visited Green Bay in August of 1986 when Lisa was murdered. His name was Lou Griffin and he had other cases against him as well. Lou A. Griffin's name had become synonymous with darkness after committing the tragic murder of Lisa. He was born on July 12, 1955, in small town Illinois and raised by his parents. As he grew older, he expressed conflicting emotions, alternating between moments of charm and unsettling aloofness. Despite his seemingly naive childhood, signs of deeper trouble lurked beneath. Lou's early education seemed promising, but his academic achievements soon gave way to distracted behavior. His youthful rebellion led to petty crime, and over time his involvement with the crime grew. He also got married to a woman named Emily, with whom he had two children. As the history of his criminal record was examined, a shocking pattern emerged. It traced back to 1970, when Lou was charged with larceny and assault, signaling the beginning of his dark journey. In the 1980s, he escalated to more serious crimes, such as robbery and assault. In 1981, Lou was convicted of second-degree assault, a felony, and he was sent to prison. After serving his sentence, he moved to Green Bay, Wisconsin in the mid-1980s. It was in the summer of 1986 when his most heinous crimes occurred. One unfortunate night, he met 22-year-old Lisa Holstead in a swampy area of the Kenyers Nature Area. Driven by his dark instincts, he assaulted the young woman, strangled her, and left her lifeless. Lou thought he had escaped justice, but when the investigation continued in 2020, the evidence began to unveil against him. The crimes he committed before were documented by investigators. It painted a grim picture of a man who had no respect for human life. After years of relentless investigation and the pursuit of justice, the name Lou A. Griffin finally echoed through the halls of the Green Bay Police Department. He was arrested for the murder of Lisa Holstead, 
He was charged based on the DNA found at the crime scene. January 15, 2021 was the day when the outrageous criminal Lou was arrested. Police arrested him at his home in Racine, Wisconsin. Faced with the weight of his actions, Lou had no choice but to face the consequences of his crime. As he stood in front of the arresting officers, the gruesome image of Lisa Holstead's lifeless body served as a heartbreaking reminder of the damage he caused. The victim's family, united in the pursuit of justice, finally got a little comfort in knowing the man responsible for their daughter's death is facing law custody. Lou A. Griffin's reign of terror finally came to an end. The Green Bay community, which had been terrified for so long, finally breathed a sigh of relief, knowing their streets were safer with him behind bars. The arrest of Lou A. Griffin wasn't just the end of a cold case. It was a testament to the unwavering dedication of the investigators, the resilience of the victim's family, and the strength of the community. All eyes were on Lou A. Griffin early in the trial. He was detained in the county jail upon his arrest, awaiting the day when he would finally face the repercussions of his horrible deeds. The trial was started on March 27, 2023, where evidence and witnesses from both parties were brought. The lawyer of Lou, Richard Jenkins, was certain that he would be rescued from the court. He added his remarks that there was insufficient evidence against him, and there could be other reasons for the presence of his DNA at the crime scene. On the other side, Lisa's lawyer, District Attorney Sarah Johnson, challenged Richard's claims in court. She presented a long history of Lou's crimes in court. It turned out that Lisa was not the only victim of Lou. Many other people fell prey to this barbaric murderer. The case took another turn. Another witness showed up who was hesitant to come to court before. It brought more strength to Lisa's case. It added in challenging Lou's claims and in pursuing justice for Lisa. Finally, after all the trials, the jury gave its decision on the 18th of July, 2023. Lou was found guilty and charged with first-degree murder. The decision was made considering the pattern of his crimes and the case of Lisa. There was a deep silence when the verdict was read in court. Lou's fate was sealed when he was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Lisa Holstead. The courtroom was filled with mixed emotions. Sadness for the loss of life, justice for the victim's family, and satisfaction that, finally, a heinous criminal is behind bars. After the news of Lou's arrest, people finally felt relieved. They had seen many decades of uncertainty about Lisa's case. Some even lost hope that this case would ever reach closure. But it finally did. It restored the trust of people in the justice system and gave them a sense of peace. Lisa's father, Robert Holstead, was emotional after the court's decision. When journalists asked about his remarks, he said, The weight was excruciating, but knowing that the man responsible for our daughter's death has finally been held accountable brings some comfort. He was in tears. Even after the court announced the punishment to the criminal, her mother still felt a weight on her chest. She was unable to bring her daughter back. She was gripping Lisa's portrait in her hands and was in tears when she said, There is no sentence that can fill the void in our hearts. Every day we miss her. The team of detectives and attorney Sarah Johnson all worked hard to bring justice to Lisa. They all stood with smiles as their hard work finally paid off. They were glad of their accomplishment. They restored people's trust in justice 
and gave a hard lesson to all criminals out there. Detective Graff said, We hope that this verdict brings some measure of peace to the community. Many media channels interviewed her parents. They remember Lisa by telling many interesting tales of Lisa. They told the media what a kind and caring soul she was. Green Bay welcomed a renewed feeling of finality as the sun sank over the city. The once cold case was no longer a terrifying mystery, but a testament to the persistence of the human spirit. On October 5, 1996, the Denver community was disturbed by police sirens responding to a call regarding an apartment on the 1900 block of East 17th Avenue. Inside, they discovered the body of a 35-year-old woman, Terry Turachak. Upon examination, the police discovered that Terry had been strangled and had sustained severe head injuries. Who could have committed such a heinous crime? And what could have transpired between Terry and her assailant that resulted in her tragic death? Denver, Colorado, with a population of 700,000, boasts a vibrant blend of history and culture, attracting many to its numerous museums. This city merges the old and new, offering a wealth of recreational and historical sites. Denver's neighborhoods exude a small-town feel where friendly residents, known for their adventurous spirit, often know their neighbors by name. However, Denver grapples with urban challenges, including a high crime rate, one of America's highest, casting a shadow over its close-knit communities. The unresolved 1996 case of Terry Turachak remains a poignant reminder of this darker aspect of city life. Terry Ann Turachak, born on May 14, 1961, hailed from the vast landscapes of Michigan. The daughter of James C. Turachak, a commendable sergeant in the U.S. Air Force and a valorous Vietnam War veteran, Terry grew up with the spirit of resilience. Her father James, even with his tough military exterior, was the very definition of a loving father to Terry. And while the details of her mother, Marlene L. Sackich, remain a mystery, it's known that Terry wasn't an only child. James Turachek Jr., her younger brother, entered the scene a few years later, and the two of them had an enduring and tight-knit bond that persisted even as they journeyed into adulthood. Terry, in her own stride, embraced motherhood with grace. She got married to Douglas A. Oakland in 1979, and they were blessed with three children. Their names are not known, however, one thing was crystal clear. Terry was a phenomenal mother. James Jr. frequently reminisced about her maternal instincts, always praising Terry for the care and love she showered upon her young ones. As the years rolled on, Terry found herself settling in Denver, Colorado, residing at 1927 East 17th Avenue. Her love life was complicated. While she had a main relationship, rumors hinted that she was open to other possibilities. Life for Terry was in a steady phase. Friends, family, and the usual ups and downs, she was making the most of her journey. Yet, with life's unpredictable ebb and flow, one can never truly forecast what's around the bend. So for Terry, too, no one could foresee that the end of her happy times was just around the corner. On Friday, October 4, 1996, Denver seemed like any other calm autumn day, with residents going about their daily routines, unaware of the looming tragedy. Terry Turachek finished her workday and headed home, looking forward to an evening with friends. With her children away, she enjoyed the solitude of her empty apartment. As evening approached, she prepared to join Denver's vibrant nightlife. At around 8 p.m., Terry stepped out, her spirit in harmony with the cities. Little breadcrumbs of Terry's night can be picked up here and there. A neighbor caught a glimpse of Terry returning around 11.30 p.m., 
nothing seemed amiss. But the wheels of time and events have a way of catching everyone off guard. The morning sun of Saturday, October 5th, cast long shadows, and a stillness took over Terry's apartment complex. Oddly, the door to Terry's apartment remained ajar. Hours ticked by, but it wasn't until the noon sun reached its zenith that a concerned neighbor noticed the open door. Perhaps he thought she had overslept, or maybe she was in the shower. With a tinge of apprehension, he called out, his voice echoing through the living room. Nothing. A quick scan revealed no sign of Terry in the usual places. The living room, kitchen, the final stop was the bedroom. The sight that greeted him there was beyond comprehension. Terry, whom he had just seen the night before, full of life and enthusiasm, now lay lifeless. Panic surged. Racing out, he fumbled for his phone and dialed 911. His voice choked with disbelief. In the distance, the piercing sound of police sirens grew louder, culminating in a cacophony outside Terry's apartment. Police officers, with a practiced calm that hid their internal turmoil, stepped in to take over. The scene was all too familiar. A life taken too soon. A community in shock. And a family left with an agonizing void. The Terry Turacek case had begun. When Terry Turacek's body was discovered, it wasn't just a blow to her family but to the entire community. To get to the bottom of this grim discovery, detectives of the Denver Police Department spearheaded the investigation. Immediately, they recognized the significance of the scene before them. The bedroom told a tale of violence. Signs of a struggle were evident, a testament to Terry's resistance. Neighbors, in their attempts to fill the gaps of that fateful night, mentioned disturbances between 1 and 1.30 a.m. However, no one had reported seeing anyone exit Terry's apartment, even though the door was conspicuously left open, an eerie invitation to the horror inside. Given the absence of forced entry, detectives surmised that the perpetrator might have been known to Terry, or had gained her trust, only to exploit it in the most heinous way. Dr. T. Henry, the medical examiner, was tasked with the grim responsibility of examining Terry's body. The results were shocking. Terry hadn't just been killed. She had been thoroughly assaulted. Strangulation was cited as the cause of death, but she had also suffered blunt force trauma. A horrid ending to a life that was otherwise filled with promise. As investigators combed through Terry's world, a hair recovered from her thigh stood out. The hope was that this tiny strand would be the key to unlocking the identity of her murderer. Piecing the narrative together, investigators connected with Terry's acquaintances and neighbors. And it wasn't long before puzzling snippets of information began to emerge. The neighbor who last saw Terry entering her apartment around 11.30 p.m. noticed she wasn't alone. An African-American man with a distinctive afro accompanied her. Whether he was a friend or a foe, he was the last known individual seen with Terry. Adding to the timeline's complexity, another neighbor reported a commotion at approximately 12.30 a.m. from Terry's apartment. Intriguingly, Around 1 a.m., Terry was seen knocking on another neighbor's door, seemingly injured, asking for money. Could this be related to the man seen with her earlier? The most telling piece of information came from Terry's boyfriend, whose name wasn't released. While he had an alibi for the night of the murder, a story from a week prior raised eyebrows. While in her apartment, Terry and her boyfriend had been robbed and assaulted by three unidentified African-American men. Was there a connection between this incident and her eventual murder? 
That question haunted the detectives. In the weeks that followed, leads were chased down. The mysterious man seen entering the apartment with Terry became a person of interest. Was he connected to the previous week's assault? Or was Terry's request for money that night somehow linked to this individual? However, despite their best efforts, the solid evidence needed to pin down a suspect remained elusive. A key suspect was even brought in, subjected to interrogation and DNA testing. But when the results came back, disappointment set in. His DNA was not a match. The community's anguish deepened with every passing day. They looked to the detectives for answers, for some semblance of justice. Terry's family, devastated by the loss, held on to hope that the perpetrator would be brought to book. However, as weeks turned into months, the once blazing trail began to dim. The detectives, despite their tireless efforts, were confronted with the harsh reality that they might never find Terry's killer. Leads that once held promise evaporated, and the case, regrettably, turned cold. In 2004, the once cold and seemingly unsolvable case of Terry Turachek experienced a sudden and unexpected revival. The curtains of time that had hidden clues and concealed the path to justice were now beginning to rise. A major breakthrough came in August of that year, almost a decade since the horrifying incident had taken place. The CODIS DNA system, a comprehensive database that houses DNA profiles from across the nation, indicated a hit. It was a match to the DNA evidence that had been recovered from Terry's body years ago. This DNA had always been a loose end for the investigators, a piece of the puzzle that refused to fit anywhere. But now, there was a lead. Detective Dixie Crimes, a seasoned investigator, was handed the reins of this reopened case. With her analytical mind and meticulous approach, she was determined to follow this new lead and see where it would take the investigation. And this DNA trail led them straight to Ricky Dawson. He was no stranger to the law. His DNA was already present within the CODIS system, indicating a past criminal history. Dawson, an African-American male, suddenly became the epicenter of this investigation. Now, with a fresh lead in their hands and a renewed zeal, the law enforcement community was once again buzzing with activity related to the Terry Turchek case. The hope was to finally bring closure to a haunting chapter in the city's history and deliver justice to a soul that had been wronged. Detective Dixie Crimes, now having a name and face to work with, began her efforts to understand the connection between Dawson and the victim. Did they know each other? Was there a motive? Were there any other pieces of evidence or witnesses that might have been overlooked during the initial investigation? The case, which had once been a chilling enigma wrapped in layers of mystery, had now transformed into a labyrinth of connections waiting to be explored. As detective crimes delved deeper, the task at hand was clear. To validate the DNA match, establish the narrative, and build a watertight case against the new prime suspect. The streets of Denver, which had once whispered rumors and theories about the Turchak case, now waited with bated breath. They looked forward to the day when they could finally say justice had been served for Terry. While much of the city was optimistic, there were still many challenges to overcome. DNA evidence, though compelling, isn't the end-all of a criminal case. It's one thing to identify a suspect, but another to prove their guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Ricky Dawson, a man whose life seemed to carry both shadows and light, born on January 24, 1961, in Florida. He was 43 years old in 2004. 
It means he'd been 35 when Terry Turacek met her tragic end in 1996. But Terry wasn't his only connection to darkness. Going back to his younger days, Dawson had his own struggles. Ricky's childhood was not without its complications. It's said that childhood behaviors often give a glimpse into an individual's future. And in Ricky's case, it was no different. His education, marital life, and other personal details remain hazy. But one thing that stands out is his criminal history. Dawson's involvement in criminal activities isn't limited to the Turchak case. His DNA was found to match an unidentified profile from a harrowing case in Seattle in 2000. The victim was a 40-year-old woman named Debbie Cascio. The tragic details surrounding Cascio's demise mirror those of Turacek. Debbie, like Terry, had suffered multiple blunt force injuries and was strangled. This unfortunate connection between the two women and Dawson brought the eyes of the law upon him once again. Debbie's story is kept alive, both by the city and by her loving daughter, Tabitha Johnson. A leaf of remembrance at the Seattle Justice Center bears Debbie's name, a gesture by the Homeless Remembrance Project to ensure her story is never forgotten. Johnson, who was only 11 when her mother passed away, has been a beacon of resilience. The memories of her mother, like those of glass-blowing art sessions or beach days, are fondly remembered. Tabitha, now a mother herself, still feels the void left by Debbie's absence. While she seeks closure and justice, the specifics surrounding her mother's case remain undisclosed, as the Seattle police haven't released further details. Dawson's criminal exploits didn't stop in Seattle or Denver. He found himself in Florida's clutches in 2004. This was when Denver police were informed of a DNA match linking him to the 1996 cold case of Terry Turacek. At this time, he was already in custody in Florida and later pleaded guilty to second-degree murder, earning a 25-year prison sentence. Now, he also stood accused of first-degree murder charges in connection to the Denver case of Terry Turacek. The moment the name Ricky Dawson surfaced, the investigation into Terry Turacek's murder intensified. Detectives reviewed the case files and interviews from the original investigation, scouring for any mention of Ricky. They didn't find his name directly, but a revelation awaited them. The description of a man, Terry's companion on the night she was killed, given by her neighbors, matched Ricky's. The depth of Ricky's criminal past was soon uncovered, and it was staggering. It wasn't just a one-time offender. There was a trail of crimes linked to his name. A prime suspect in the Terry Turchak case, detectives knew they needed to speak with him. In December 2004, they found themselves face-to-face -face with Ricky Dawson at the Sewanee Correctional Institute in Florida, where he was already incarcerated. Their goal was clear. Find out what Ricky knew about Terry and establish his involvement in her tragic end. While the details of their conversation remain confidential, the interview led to another intriguing lead, an associate of Ricky's who was close to him during the time of the murder. This associate, whose name wasn't revealed, was well acquainted with Terry. He admitted to spending time in her apartment, and even confirmed being there with both Ricky and Terry the night she was killed. According to him, the three of them had been using drugs, though he claimed to have left around midnight, unaware of the events that followed the pieces were starting to fall into place. The detectives now had a path laid out in front of them. They conducted a crucial DNA test. The new DNA samples taken from Ricky were compared to the hair found on Terry's body. And there it was, a match to the hair's major DNA profile. 
with this conclusive evidence, it was clear that Ricky Dawson was connected to Terry's murder. But in a surprising turn, the proceedings to charge him with her murder were not immediately pursued. Perhaps, some theorized, it was because Ricky already had around 20 years remaining on his current sentence. As a result, Terry's case remained in a dormant state for over another decade. A long 22 years after Terry Turachak's tragic demise, a new hope emerged for justice. Fourteen years later, Detective John McGrail from the Denver Police Cold Case Unit was given the responsibility of revisiting the case. As he poured over the details, McGrail realized the evidence was pretty compelling. To him, it seemed almost like an open and shut case. Wanting to leave no stone unturned, in December 2018, he made the decision to submit the evidence for further laboratory analysis. This included material collected from the crime scene and the findings from Terry's post-mortem examination. By August 2019, the results were in. The DNA evidence provided a conclusive match. The gears of justice were starting to turn faster. The pieces of the puzzle were all pointing in one direction. Ricky Dawson. The same Ricky who had been serving time in Florida for another crime. With the renewed evidence at hand, it became clear it was time to take concrete action against Dawson for Terry's murder. Fast forward to January 26, 2023, a pivotal day in the investigation. An arrest warrant was officially issued against Ricky Dawson, charging him with the first-degree murder of Terry Turacek. Ricky, now age 62, found himself in an even tighter legal bind. Despite already being incarcerated in Florida, the wheels of justice did not stop. He was extradited by the Denver Police Department to face his charges head-on in Denver. The gravity of the situation became real for Ricky on February 23rd, when he was informed of the charges against him. A court appearance was marked on the calendar for March 23rd, 2023, a day many eagerly awaited. Although the court's final ruling is yet to be publicly disclosed, given the mounting evidence, many believe Ricky Dawson will be convicted for his involvement in Terry's tragic end. For James Turacek, Terry's brother, the pain of losing his sister in 1996 was a wound that never truly healed. For 27 long years, he grappled with a mix of despair and hope uncertain if justice would ever be served for Terry's untimely death. Yet with the recent news of an arrest in connection to his sister's murder, James was engulfed by a flood of emotions. James shared with the media his relentless commitment to his sister's case, stating he had always held on to the belief that the truth would someday come to light. The realization that the alleged perpetrator was in the process of being extradited to face charges brought the gravity of the situation to the forefront for James. He spoke to the void left by Terry's absence, describing it as an irreplaceable loss that time wouldn't heal. Family moves forward, James stated, emphasizing the gaping void that Terry's departure had created. He often wondered about the milestones she missed especially the joy she would have felt becoming a grandmother. Terry, as James finally remembered, had a radiant spirit that touched everyone she knew. James admitted that while part of him yearns for forgiveness, he's not quite there yet. The pain, still too fresh, makes it a difficult journey. But above all, he firmly expressed his desire for justice to prevail. James hopes that Ricky Dawson faces the full weight of the law and that he remains behind bars for the remainder of his days, ensuring that Terry's memory is honored by the justice she rightfully deserves. 52 years ago, on 20th July 1971, a strange case surfaced at the Burlington police station when the dead body of 24-year-old Rita Curran 
was found strangled in her apartment by her roommates. The whole neighborhood was panicked about this barbaric murder. Despite a thorough initial investigation, the case ended up going cold. It would take over 50 years for it to reach its final conclusion. How were investigators able to spot the murderer after over five decades? Why did it take so long to find the murderer? Burlington is located in the U.S. state of Vermont. The city is famous for its rich heritage, including old streets, museums, and monuments. It is also famous for being home to the University of Vermont and Champlain College. Burlington has the highest population in Vermont and is the seat of Chittenden County. It is located 45 miles south of the Canadian U.S. border and 95 miles south of Montreal. In the midst of this serene city, the barbaric murder of Rita took place in 1971, which shattered the whole community and traumatized Burlington for years. Rita Curran was born on 21st June 1947. She was the first child of her parents, Mary Eleanor Donahue Curran and Thomas F. Curran. When Rita turned 24 years old, she moved out of her parents' home to become a second grade teacher. She started to live in an apartment in Burlington with three other roommates. In the summer of 1971, she was taking graduate courses at the University of Vermont. She was also working as a chambermaid at a local motel as her part-time job. She was an ambitious girl with a bright future, living her best life. Rita didn't know that her life would be ferociously ended on July 19, 1971. July 19, 1971 was a routine evening in Rita Curran's serene suburban neighborhood. As dusk fell over the beautiful surroundings, a tragic incident descended on this peaceful community, forever ruining its beauty. Rita had spent the earlier hours of the evening with friends at a local gathering. Rita, known for her pleasant demeanor, left the gathering around 9.30 p.m., saying her goodbyes and arrived home. Nobody could have predicted that this would be Rita's last sighting alive. Rita was reported to have come home around 11.20 p.m. on July 19th. When her roommates arrived at roughly 12.30 a.m., there were signs of a scuffle. The furniture was slightly ajar, and a little ornamental table had toppled. When they looked for Rita, they were faced with the horrible discovery of her lifeless body in her bedroom. They immediately dialed 911 and reported what had happened. On the dreadful night of July 20th, 1971, the lifeless body of 24-year-old Rita Curran was discovered in her Brooks Avenue apartment in the city of Burlington, Vermont. Everyone was rocked to their core. The puzzling circumstances surrounding her murder sparked an extensive investigation. Many pieces of evidence were found at the crime scene, including hairs clutched in Rita's hands, fingernail scrapings, torn nightgowns and bedsheets, hair curlers, and a cigarette butt, among other items. These items had blood and biological matter on them, but they didn't reveal any clue about the murderer. DNA technology was not very advanced in the 1970s, making all evidence futile. An investigator took a sample to compare the soil from Rita's bedroom with that from the basement. A section of linoleum flooring and a portion of the door with a significant blood stain was taken out. The bedroom floor where Rita was discovered was examined for latent fingerprints. The murderer escaped through the apartment's window, which had been left open. They had also cut the phone line to prevent her from calling for help. Early on in the inquiry, the FBI was involved in helping with the evidence processing. Chief Medical Examiner Dr. Lawrence Harris performed Rita Curran's autopsy. Dr. Harris stated that Rita Curran died due to suffocation caused by physical strangulation. 
she'd been beaten badly and assaulted. The cause of death was determined to be homicide. Rita was slain between 11.20 p.m. on July 19th and 12.30 a.m. on July 20th, a 70-minute interval. Detectives repeatedly returned to the apartment building and its surrounding area to speak with tenants about what they may have seen or heard on July 19th. Three days after the homicide, a Vermont state trooper knocked again on Rita's building's second and third floor apartment doors. The second floor tenants were home this time, but the four women couldn't contribute useful information to the investigation. William DeRoos and his wife Michelle were on the third floor when the police knocked on their door for the second time. Asking for any details about the night Rita was slain, just two stories below them. The husband and wife said they were home, but they hadn't seen or heard anything unusual that day. During the first inquiry, over a hundred persons were interrogated, with at least some of them submitting to polygraph testing, while detectives compiled a suspect list. In 1971, the list included more than a dozen names. But Rita Curran's family would face the end of 1971 without any answers. The Burlington Free Press announced a $3,000 secret witness reward. Several reminders of the reward were issued in 1972, but the first anniversary of Rita Curran's murder passed with no public progress in the case. Slowly, due to a lack of leads to follow, the case turned cold. More than 50 anniversaries of her death would pass. Rita's father Thomas died in 1991, and her mother died in 2002, with no idea who had taken their daughter's life. Though her brothers and other family members remained hopeful decade after decade, remaining current strong for one another and for Rita, that hope had expired by the year 50 in 2021. Detective Jeff Beerworth was working on Rita Curran's case in 2014, and he found evidence that could potentially have DNA information that had previously been difficult or impossible to extract in the prior decade of the inquiry. The Lark cigarette butt discovered behind her right elbow piqued his interest. Rita's roommate smoked, but not that brand. Thus, it seemed likely that someone other than the house's tenants had smoked the cigarette and dropped or otherwise left it in the center of the murder scene, preferably with extractable DNA still on it. When tested, the OCME or Office of Chief Medical Examiner in New York City was able to collect a male DNA profile from the cigarette butt. The DNA profile was entered into CODIS the combined DNA index system, but there was no match at the time, indicating that the potential suspect had never been convicted of a felony before or since Rita's murder, or that his profile had not been entered into the database as of 2014. With no hits in CODIS, they chose to shift their focus to methods of family comparison, it's a technique that has gotten a lot of attention in recent years, both positive and negative, and has helped identify suspects in several high-profile cases around the country. The DNA was delivered to Parabon Nanolabs for sequencing in 2022, and the results were submitted to GEDmatch, Family Tree DNA, and other genetic genealogy sites to undertake deeper family tree research. It's also a tool for law enforcement to undertake their familial DNA analysis, like in the case of Rita Curran. C.C. Moore, Parabon Nanolab's chief genetic genealogist, conducted the genealogy investigation for Rita's case. C.C. was given the suspect list compiled over the last five decades of the probe as she began her research. The revived investigation had introduced previously unknown names to the suspect pool. Thus, several new names were added to that list before it reached CC. William DeRuse, one of Brooks Avenue's building's upper tenants, 
was among the newcomers. Lieutenant Treeb saw his proximity to the crime scene as a strong link. His name had also been featured in various reports in the original case file, since the police had spoken with him and his wife during multiple canvassings of the neighborhood. The technicians at DNA Labs International were not informed that a familial DNA comparison had revealed the likely identity of the DNA donor on the cigarette when they were analyzing the additional evidence. DNA Labs International discovered that the linoleum square had blood on the portions of wood removed from the apartment's back door. The same DNA was found on the cigarette butt. They called it an unknown source. The same contributor of the DNA on Rita's house coat was found after some time. Then the DNA profile on Rita's underwear was discovered to be a blend of at least two individuals, with DNA from the unknown source and some other individual. These findings were noteworthy, because the presence of DNA from unknown, not only on the cigarette butt, but also on the clothing ripped from Rita's body during the attack, indicated that the cigarette was not merely a red herring, dropped into the crime scene without any real significance to the case. William DeRue's DNA was all over that cigarette butt, and it couldn't be ruled out of Rita's housecoat or undergarments. It was becoming more clear that he was the perpetrator of the horrible crime. To verify the familial DNA results, detectives needed to take a sample from William DeRuse's closest living sibling for direct DNA comparison. DeRuse's half-brother Andy, who was found by Detective Jeanette of the Burlington Police Department. Andy cooperated in assisting authorities with the inquiry and offered his DNA sample for comparison to William DeRuse. The sample was sent out to be compared to the profile discovered on the Lark cigarette butt. According to the report, the likelihood that Andy was connected to the sample as a half-sibling was 97.03%. Michelle Roach, William DeRuse's wife at the time of the murder, was interviewed as part of the new investigation. On July 5, 1971, they married just over two weeks before Rita Curran was brutally attacked and murdered two stories below their own apartment. Michelle was shown images of Rita Curran by the detectives. She commented on Rita's beauty, but she didn't recognize her. She couldn't recall ever mingling with any of the other tenants in the Brooks Avenue apartment complex, let alone meeting them formally. However, Michelle recalls being awakened by a police officer who informed her that someone had been seriously injured. She couldn't recollect the rest of the talk with the cops, but she did recall what her then-husband said to her after the officer had departed. William advised Michelle not to disclose that he hadn't been home at the time of the murder. His reason was that he had a criminal record and didn't want authorities to try to blame him for the incident. However, William was not at home during the brief 70-minute period when Rita Curran was allegedly assaulted and killed. More than 50 years later, Michelle told detectives that she and her husband of two weeks had gotten into a quarrel and he had gone for a cool-down walk. Michelle had no idea when or for how long he had been gone. She couldn't recall what he wore, if he did wash that night, or whether the clothing he was wearing vanished soon after. She also couldn't recall if he had any bruises or other injuries when he returned. Michelle knew William smoked cigarettes, but she couldn't recall what brand he smoked. In the 2022 interview, she told the detectives that she would have informed the police if she had any suspicions that her husband was to blame for Rita's passing. Michelle claimed that although she never asked William DeRuse directly if he killed Rita Curran, the idea of him carrying out such a heinous deed was inconceivable. 
The mysterious William DeRuze, a man with a troubled past, became a key player in the decades-long Rita Curran cold case. DeRuze, a 31-year-old man, lived in the same building with singer and teacher Rita Curran, aged 24 in 1971. On the tragic evening of July 20th, 1971, when Curran was viciously murdered in her Brooks Avenue apartment, their lives were irrevocably entwined. DeRuce, who lived directly above Curran, came into focus during the preliminary investigation. DeRuce's life saw a series of puzzling twists and turns after the murder. He left Vermont and started a trip that took him to Thailand, where he decided to live a monastic life. Those who knew him were surprised by this change in him. Darkness appeared to follow him, despite his spiritual search as suspicions of a criminal past emerged. However, DeRuce's life ended too soon, in 1986, when he passed away in San Francisco from a narcotics overdose. His passing signaled the end of a chapter, but the doubts and concerns about him persisted. DeRuce wasn't mentioned again in relation to the Rita Curran case until 2022. New information about his potential involvement was revealed due to DNA analysis and investigative genetic genealogy. If DeRuce had lived at the time of the reinvestigation, the course of events might have taken a different path. The newly discovered DNA evidence, altered testimonies, and re-examined facts would almost certainly have resulted in DeRuce's arrest when officials pieced together the jigsaw of that fateful night in 1971. The Rita Curran case represents a striking tribute to law enforcement's tenacity, remarkable advances in forensic technology, and an unwavering commitment to preserving justice. Rita Curran's memory can now be cherished as a tragedy and a symbol of resilience reminding us that even the most elusive answers can be discovered when dedication and contemporary science come together in the dogged quest for the truth. On Sunday, June 12, 2005, 21-year-old Ashley Parlier had a heated argument with her parents, Russ and Sherry Parlier, prompting her to storm out of their Battle Creek home. A week later, she still hadn't returned home, prompting her family to report her as missing. For more than a decade, all efforts to find her whereabouts were in vain. Until 18 years later, her family and the police finally got the answers they had been desperately seeking. Where could Ashley have possibly gone? What led to the eventual discovery of what had happened to her? Located in Michigan, Battle Creek is a vibrant city of over 50,000 residents, as per the 2020 census. The city boasts a mix of recreational spots and historic sites, fostering a close-knit community where residents know each other by name, engage in adventurous activities. Despite the warm and united atmosphere, the city grapples with significant safety issues having a violent crime rate notably higher than the national averages. This context intensified the community's distress following the 2005 disappearance of Ashley Parlier, a case that left residents shaken and seeking answers. Born to Russell Jr. and Sherry Parlier on October 16, 1983, Ashley Parlier's entrance into the world was filled with joy. The second child in the Parlier household, her early years painted the picture of a young girl who was on the quieter side of things. This wasn't due to a lack of zest for life, but more of her inherent nature. In fact, her older sister Nicole often quipped about Ashley's unique quality, an undeniable trust in people. Ashley, with her deep brown eyes and a smile showcasing slightly crooked yet utterly charming teeth, looked for the good in everyone. She really believed people were just as she imagined, good-hearted, Nicole reminisced. 
despite functioning at the cognitive level of a 12 to 14 year old due to a mild mental disability, Ashley never let that define her. Her spirit was unyielding and relentless. Graduating from Battle Creek High School, she nabbed a job at the nearby Taco Bell, located in the bustling block of Northeast Capitol Avenue. With each paycheck, her dreams of owning her very own car started to crystallize. She'd tuck away a little from her earnings, dreaming of the freedom a car would bring. But for all of Ashley's positivity and aspirations, life had different plans. The unsuspecting turns of destiny lurked in the shadows, and for someone as trusting and kind as Ashley, the world was, unfortunately, not ready to reciprocate her kindness. As she felt hopeful for a better future, no one knew a challenge was about to dim her positive outlook. Standing at 5 feet 9 inches, 21-year-old Ashley Parlier had a slender frame, weighing in at just around 100 pounds. For someone of her stature, even the slightest physical change was bound to catch attention. This was particularly true for her doting parents, who noticed an unfamiliar bump in her daughter's physique on that fateful day of June 12, 2005. Given Ashley's innocent nature, paired with her unique mental capacity, her parents' immediate concerns gravitated towards her well-being. Their worries were compounded by the potential health implications, and they were eager to get her checked out. Prenatal care, they believed, was essential if Ashley were to carry a child. However, the realization, the concerns, and the ensuing discussions weren't easy for anyone, least of all, Ashley. The atmosphere in the Parlier household in Bedford Township's urban neighborhood grew increasingly tense. After a heated argument, a distressed Ashley quickly left her family home. In her haste, she didn't take many belongings, but she did have around $700 in cash. Given her lack of a car, driver's license, cell phone, or credit card, this cash was her only means. Ashley's departure was initially thought of as her needing a brief respite, a little time to cool off, maybe even spend a day or two at a friend's place. The Parlier family clung to this hope. As the minutes stretched into hours and the hours melted into days, a deepening sense of dread began to envelop the Parlier household. Initially clinging to the hope that their trusting Ashley had sought solace at a friend's place and would eventually return, the family's optimism slowly turned to panic. Each unanswered phone call, each door knock that wasn't Ashley, weighed heavily on their hearts, rendering the once vibrant home eerily quiet. But as the days passed and their worst fears began to seem like a daunting reality, the Parlier family could wait no longer. Realizing something was terribly amiss, they made the decision to report Ashley missing to the police, their hopes giving way to grief and anxiety. The detectives immediately set their sights on investigating the enigmatic disappearance of Ashley Parlier. At the onset, the evidence seemed sparse. The image of Ashley in her checkered shirt, paired with blue jeans and brown leather sandals, was broadcasted to the public, in hopes that someone had seen something, anything that could lead to her whereabouts. While Ashley's physical appearance was distinct and memorable, her emotional state prior to her disappearance was of paramount concern. Her unexpected pregnancy, her vulnerability due to her mental capacity, and the monumental dispute she had with her family just before she vanished added layers of complexity to the case. In what seemed like a promising lead, several supposed sightings of Ashley poured in from the Houghton Lake area. The family's despair was momentarily alleviated with hopes of her safe return. Yet this glimmer of hope was short-lived, as each reported sighting 
turned out to be a dead end, leaving the investigators and the family equally frustrated. The detectives then turned their focus to those closest to Ashley, Sherry and Russell Parlier, her parents. They found themselves under the lens of suspicion, particularly due to the delay in reporting her disappearance. While Russell willingly undertook a polygraph test and was cleared, Sherry declined, citing health reasons. Later, it was revealed that Sherry was exhibiting early symptoms of Huntington's disease. Nicole, Ashley's sister, underscored the rarity of Ashley's prolonged absence, noting that this behavior was highly out of character for her. The family had simply thought she was at a friend's place cooling off after the heated argument, expecting her to come home soon. This naive assumption delayed their call to the police, making the investigation even more challenging. The web of suspicion grew as the detectives tried reaching out to Ashley's ex-boyfriend, whose name wasn't revealed, and believed to be the father of her unborn child. At the time, he was involved with another woman, who too was expecting his child. Though he wasn't cleared as a suspect, no evidence pointed towards his involvement in her disappearance. As they delved deeper, the investigators encountered a myriad of leads, some suggesting that Ashley might have been in a vulnerable mental state. This led the police on a grim search for a body, hoping to find clues that could provide a semblance of closure. However, they found nothing. Another theory proposed that Ashley had been robbed, but the lack of any change in her social security status ruled that out. With each passing day, the grim reality began to settle. The detectives reluctantly concluded that Ashley might have fallen victim to foul play. They feared she was no longer alive. The Battle Creek Police Department, despite their best efforts, saw the case grow colder with each passing year. Over an 18-year span, numerous officers took a crack at Ashley's puzzling disappearance. The once hot trail had now turned icy, with several persons of interest but no concrete evidence against any of them. In a surprising turn in 2020, speculations arose that Ashley might have been murdered outside of Battle Creek City which led to the case being handed over to the sheriff's department. The mystery seemed to have reached a stalemate until 2021, when an unexpected breakthrough rekindled the hopes of solving the case. However, as the years rolled on, the flame of hope dimmed. The trail of clues had gone stale, and the once hot case was now a frozen tundra of mystery. Despite the best efforts of the investigators, the leads had all but vanished, leaving them in a chilly state of uncertainty. With no new leads, no conclusive evidence, and a myriad of unanswered questions, the case of Ashley Parlier's disappearance had once again turned cold. In the intricate web of cold cases, every now and then a sudden jolt of unexpected information can reignite the hopes of solving a long dormant mystery. For the Ashley Parlier case, that moment came from an unexpected place, Pennsylvania. Calhoun County officers were startled when they received a communication from Pennsylvania law enforcement in January 2021. Pennsylvania detectives were deep into the questioning of 44-year-old Herod David Hallman III this man wasn't just any suspect. He was known to be a serial killer. This revelation immediately piqued the interest of the investigators connected to Ashley's case. What could the questioning of such a notorious criminal possibly reveal about the disappearance of Ashley? The name Harold David Holman III might not immediately ring a bell, but it carries a dark history. Born on November 29, 1978, Harold spent some time of his teen years living in Germany with his father. 
Yet, as his father moved to Turkey, young Hallman chose to stay in Germany with a girlfriend, appearing to the world as just an ordinary young man. But appearances can be deceiving. When Hallman was just 20, he committed his first known murder. His victim was Joseph Whitehurst, a 21-year-old son of an Air Force colonel. Whitehurst's body was discovered outside Ramstein Air Base, brutally attacked with a club. Under German custody for another matter, Hallman confessed, claiming self-defense. Due to his age and a schizophrenia diagnosis, he received a lenient six-year term at a reform school. Later, Hallman returned to America, finding work as a truck driver and living near Battle Creek Lakeview. Around this period, he became intertwined with the tragic disappearance of Ashley Parlier in 2005. Fast forward to June 13, 2018. Tiana Phillips, a mother of two, vanished. After three years, during Holman's interrogation, he remarked he didn't intend to kill Phillips specifically. He just had an urge to kill. Then there's Erica Schultz. She went missing on December 6, 2020. Connected to Hallman through phone records, he nonchalantly compared her murder to just another day at the park. When finally apprehended, Hallman was found injured along Pennsylvania Railroad tracks, viewing his actions as sins needing atonement. Hospitalized, he confessed to both Schultz's and Phillips' murders. Later, in jail, he wrote a letter to his estranged wife detailing his crime against Phillips, a dark attempt to show his devotion to her. Notably, Holman had a pattern. His victims disappeared and suffered head injuries. He would attack, ensuring they were unconscious. Then he would leave their bodies in remote locations. His crimes were systematic and terrible. Holman's dark thoughts and motivations weren't clear-cut. He had complex ideas about power dynamics, researching serial killers out of curiosity. He believed in a clear power dynamic in relationships, where one person is dominant and the other submissive. When his wife didn't fulfill the submissive role, he sought to find that dynamic with someone else. When questioned, Hallman remembered every detail of his crimes. He knew them intimately. He admitted that, if not apprehended, he would kill again. In 2021, while Pennsylvania detectives were investigating the heinous acts of 44-year-old serial killer Harold David Hallman III, they uncovered unexpected revelations about Ashley's case after identifying two other victims. Tiana Phillips and Erica Schultz, whom he had killed. During the interrogation, Holman surprised the officers by asking if they could consolidate the cases of Phillips, Schultz, and Parlier. He was hoping to avoid multiple trials. This mention of Parlier caught the detectives off guard. Her case hadn't been a part of their discussion. Their initial bewilderment turned to intensified curiosity. Could Holman provide the missing link in Parlier's disappearance? Pushing further on the Parlier angle, detectives were met with a shocking confession. Holman candidly expressed his grim curiosity about taking a life. Quote, I just wanted to see what it felt like, he said. For him, there was no experience, no drug that could rival the sensation of taking another's life. This morbid curiosity was what led him to his violent acts. His words painted a portrait of a deeply disturbed mind. Once this startling confession came to light, the detectives immediately reached out to the Calhoun County Police Department to relay the new developments in the Parlier case. Piqued with the interest of getting to know more details from Hallman, the investigators working on Parlier's case immediately went to question him as well. Their subsequent investigations corroborated Hallman's ties to Ashley Parlier. 
Records confirm that Hallman resided in Battle Creek between 2002 and 2009, during which he had been in contact with the missing girl. Digging deeper, the police pieced together a haunting timeline. After a disagreement at her home, Ashley sought refuge with Hallman in Emmett Township in Michigan. She confided in him about her family's concerns and the possibility of her being pregnant. However, this visit took a tragic turn. A heated argument erupted between the two, culminating in Hallman violently assaulting Ashley. In a sinister twist, he transported her to the remote Pennsylvania hills. There, in a secluded spot, he ended her life. Altman's confession provided closure in some respects, but also deepened the tragedy. He recalled leaving Ashley's remains in the northern area of Newton Township and disposing of his blood-stained clothes. While the interrogation was still going on, Hallman shed more light on his relationship with Ashley Parlier. His confession revealed that their paths had first crossed at a gathering where she was present with her parents. This chance encounter led to a conversation between the two, paving the way for a deeper connection in the days to come. Hallman narrated the unfolding events of a fateful day when Ashley had a disagreement with her parents. She reached out to him, not as part of any plan he had conceived, but as someone she seemed to trust. When she visited him, Ashley confided about the pressure she felt from her parents to take a pregnancy test. What came as a shock was Hallman's admission that he was the father of Ashley's unborn child. This revelation turned the atmosphere tense, leading to a confrontation between the two. On the evening of June 13, 2005, in the heat of their dispute, Hallman's temper flared uncontrollably. He struck Ashley, rendering her unconscious. He drove her to a secluded location described as an overgrown field in Michigan, roughly 10 miles away from the town center. This remote spot with a nearby garage, or maybe a vacant house, became the backdrop of a bleak scenario. Hallman recollected the eeriness of the situation, with Ashley's motionless body in the back of the vehicle and the surrounding silence. He noted the absence of passing cars, which reinforced his feeling that this was an ideal place to end Ashley's life. He recounted the moment describing how he removed Ashley from the car, and in a fit of rage, ended her life, ensuring she was no more. Hallman then headed home, where he washed away all the evidence. He later discarded his bloody clothes at Meyer, a popular American supercenter where he worked at the time. Disturbingly, Hallman's involvement with Ashley's case didn't end there. He admitted to revisiting the site years later, only to discover Ashley's skeletal remains. His confession came with an apology directed at the Parlier family. He expressed remorse, especially for Ashley's murder, stating it was one act he regretted more than any other crimes he committed. Police efforts in the Ashley Parlier case were nothing short of relentless. Determined to bring Ashley back home, they tirelessly pursued leads and answers for nearly two decades. And while the case presented many challenges, it never dulled their commitment. So when Harold Hallman's confession came to light, authorities were hopeful. It was crucial to corroborate his story, so they asked him to pinpoint the exact location where he had left Ashley's remains. For officers and prosecutors alike, this wasn't just any other case. It was deeply emotional demanding countless hours and resources over the years. The search for answers saw a parade of detectives over the years, all dedicated to uncovering the truth behind Ashley's disappearance. When local leads ran cold, their search extended far beyond city limits. They journeyed across the nation, 
reaching out to potential witnesses and following any leads in places as varied as California, Maryland, and Pennsylvania. The investigative team was robust, with key figures like Detective John Pignatero from the Calhoun County Sheriff's Department, Detective Dave Hominga, and Detective Sergeant Chris Suara from the Michigan State Police. Their collective efforts led them to a wooded expanse along a six and a half mile road in Newton Township, just south of Battle Creek. March 30th, 2022 marked an intense search day. Almost two dozen officers scoured the area, hoping to find any trace of Ashley. But hours went by with no success. To add another layer of complexity, locals mentioned that the landscape had drastically changed since Ashley's disappearance. What was once farmland had been parceled out and sold to various owners over the years. Despite the intensity of the search and the hope riding on Hallman's confession, a significant hurdle emerged. Hallman, after so many years, struggled to recall the exact location where he had left Ashley. The developments in the area over the years had transformed the once familiar terrain, making it difficult for him to identify the spot. With no remains found, the search for Ashley continues. The commitment of the police remains unwavering, with hopes of someday bringing closure to this heart-wrenching case. Harold Hallman's trial in connection with Parlier's case took a rather direct path, considering the nuances of such investigations. By the time he stood for trial, it's important to note that Hallman had already been convicted for the deaths of two other women. This grim track record weighed heavily during the proceedings. Surprisingly, even with these prior convictions, Hallman expressed a palpable fear of the death penalty. Hallman had been held at the Luzerne County Jail leading up to the trial. In February 2023, he took a strategic legal route. Hallman pled guilty to the second-degree murder of Ashley Parlier. His motivation for the plea? A deal. In collaboration with the Luzerne County District Attorney's Office, Hallman agreed to assist Calhoun County Police in locating Ashley's remains. In return, he would escape the looming threat of the death penalty. During the trial, both the defense and prosecution laid out their arguments. Hallman's defense likely focused on his cooperation with the police and his plea agreement. Meanwhile, the prosecution highlighted the gravity of his crimes, especially in light of his prior convictions. In terms of testimonies, the most anticipated was that of Hallman himself. His previous confession was scrutinized, and while no new testimonies were mentioned, the weight of his admission was undeniable. The verdict was forthcoming. The man responsible for taking several lives would not be given the opportunity for parole. Instead, Hallman faced two life sentences, with an additional life sentence pending his scheduled sentencing in April 2023. Though Hallman's legal journey seems to be reaching its conclusion, the quest for closure in Ashley's case remains. The Calhoun County Sheriff's Department continues to seek information that might help locate Ashley's remains. If anyone possesses information pertinent to the case, they're urged to reach out to the Calhoun County Sheriff's Office directly at 269-781-0880. Their commitment to finding answers remains as steadfast as ever. Ashley Parlier's case spanned nearly two decades, casting a haunting cloud over her family. Her parents, Sherry and Russell, tragically passed away in 2020, never knowing their daughter's fate. The torment deepened for Ashley's sister, Nicole. She learned that Ashley had approached Holman for help, only to be cruelly betrayed. Nicole's grief was palpable. Quote, the hard part is my parents didn't get to hear this, she lamented, reflecting on the heartbreak and suspicion that surrounded her family. Nicole connected with other victim sisters, 
sharing their mutual grief. Together they stood united, focusing on remembering their loved ones, not the man who took them away. We're going to remember how they were good people, Nicole firmly stated. The discovery brought closure for the family, and while the quest to find Ashley's remains continues, they finally know the heart-wrenching truth. What could have driven Holman to commit such a heinous act? And how did he manage to evade detection for so long? Let us know your thoughts in the comments. If there's another case you'd like us to dive into, drop your recommendations below. For more riveting true crime tales, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. We appreciate your engagement and continued support.